Double Primer is back-to-back -back conversations with someone passionate about their work and passionate about someone else's work, mostly art and mostly Atlanta. I'm your host, Sean Mills. So we're back with Roxanne and Ashley, and we're talking about favorite shows today. Get right into it. Ashley, what's your favorite show that you're watching at the moment? Meteor Garden. The, the rebirth. It's 2018 Meteor Garden, yeah. What, what is that? That is a Chinese, it's an Asian drama, um, so it's in Chinese. They had, do you want me to get into yeah. it? To all the well, just give me like the synopsis. So it's based on um, a manga called Boys Over Flowers or Boys Before Flowers, and they actually made a show out of it that was South Korean in the mid-2000s, and then in the early 2000s, there was another Meteor Garden show, which, same storyline, but it was in Taiwanese. So I've watched them all. And I'm kind of obsessed with the current one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Asian dramas are my jam. The, <laughs> what an unexpected choice. I, I've actually <laughs> seen some of these because my, my mom's seen every version that you just mentioned. Okay. She, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so just r right off the back, I'm reacting to that because like um, my mom's from the Philippines. Okay. And so the, these um, so Asian... my mom. Okay. <laughs> these... Um, Asian dramas, especially for Filipinos, um, that is a way that they can be in touch with the culture they lost mm -hmm. when they came over here. That it's like they get to see people that eat rice and and all sorts of like cultural things. Um, so, uh, Boys Over Flowers, like, so you're a fan of the franchise too, or just a specific show that's your favorite now, or is it like the manga too? I haven't read the manga yet. I'm I'm gonna have to, and I'll be honest. Uh, the new Meteor Garden. Is the reason why I went back and watched okay, yeah. Boys Over Flowers and then the other one, and I will be finding the manga. Mm -hmm. I was telling Roxanne this morning, totally off, <laughs> off here, but like we, I had sushi, we had sushi for lunch yesterday, and my husband was like, "I'm gonna eat with chopsticks," and I was like, "Honey, is this because I've been watching all these <laughs> Asian dramas lately, and you feel like you need to keep up with me?" Yeah. And so yeah. I'm like, I'm like, you never, you never try to eat your meal with chopsticks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like I, I understand that kind of ecology where like for the show Death Note that was a similar thing. Mm -hmm. It was a comic book. They made a movie. They made another movie. They made a new remake on Netflix. So oh, it's yeah. like once you like one, you end up kind of like consuming them all and, mm -hmm. and going back to. Mm -hmm. So Roxanne, right now, what's your one that your favorite at the moment? Um, in general, I like to go back and look like and watch stuff that's probably already over um for the most part things are pretty wrapped up that's kind of my my brain's like yeah i'm just gonna watch it all the way through um but my current is westworld mm -hmm. which is why i didn't know if you're listening to um earlier but westworld is something that i'm actually keeping track of watching it week to week before that it was the um the revived twin peaks series mm -hmm. so the things I keep current are like those, I don't know, grown up shows, mm -hmm. <laughs> but the shows that, you know, I, I watch between those weekly appearances are things that are just kind of already done, wrapped up. They're never bringing it back. Like CSI Las Vegas, they're not going to do that. You know, like they're not <laughs> going to, they already have four other cities. They're good to go. So, you know. The <laughs> okay. Well, you picked another juicy one because it was based on a book by Michael Crichton. Um, there was a movie. Did you see the original movie? Of what? Of Westworld. No, I didn't. Yeah, so there was a, a movie made um, in the past starring Yul Brenner, who plays the man in black. Um, and interestingly, for people who have seen or are interested in Westworld, um, there was uh, a kind of spiritual successor aspect of Westworld and Jurassic Park. You can imagine it's set kind of in the future. It's like a, a, a park that goes something goes wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So in the original Westworld movie, they get into the it going bad faster, mm -hmm. and so to reverse back talking to the sh about the show, the first season you kind of get to see like an actual like day in the life aspect to Westworld, right? Yeah, a lot of people it was hard for them to follow the pacing of the first season because it was so slow, but it was all the world building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, mm. And then, like, it was just, like, the fall of it in se the second season, which I don't know if you're going to end up watching it or anything. It is patience. You don't have to worry <laughs> about spoiling it for me. Okay. Not. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you have to be really patient to get through the first season. Everyone kind of feels that way about it, I think. I actually, like, prefer the 
the first season, the second season. But um, there's lots of entry points. So, like, for mm -hmm. instance, for some people, I think it was a prestige thing because of the um, Christopher Nolan's brother is the writer and the executive producer. Um, and then also, I think there was some carryover from Game of Thrones where there was sort of the push of, like, this is going to be HBO's, like, answer to what do we have besides West uh, um, Game of Thrones. Um, so what led you to it originally? One, I like HBO series. I have it. Um, but Westworld, I think uh, my husband, like, really likes those kinds of themes. And then we started watching it. I mean, I like it in general. So I just started and ended up following into it. I... A lot of stuff, I'm too empathetic. So, like, when there's, like, a lot of craziness happening, I get too sucked in. Um, so it was good that this was the kind of show I had to wait week to week because emotionally, can't handle it. Twin Peaks is the same as well. <laughs> and um, I, it took me a while to catch, like, to catch on with it, though, because I, I don't love Westerns, mm -hmm. you know? Like, that world is not something I gravitate towards. So, really, I had to prime myself into it um but when they start introducing different timelines and different perspectives that's when my brain starts getting more into things and but that was you know you have to get in a couple episodes so i also like cerebral stuff um but i can't do it too often because i get freaked out a lot <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah i mean westworld was not a natural thing for me but some like, I admit to myself that I have to get into the storyline a bit. So, Roxanne, and, you had a coffee, or excuse me, a coffee break, you know, water cooler show that it's the sort of thing where, like, oh, have you seen it? People will try to get you into Westworld. Mm -hmm. Now, Ashley, you have the opposite, where um, unless you have a very specific subculture that you're hanging out with, there's not going to be people getting you into Meteor Garden, right? Like, how did you, was it... Like, what was the first time you even heard about it? Like, So I re I'm really interested in anime. I read manga, and I have watched several other Asian drama shows on Netflix. And so now my Netflix is all, they're always like, here's this new Asian show drama we have on here, Ashley. You'll love it. But I think Netflix is so great about introducing you to these new genres, mm -hmm. though. Because I, I wouldn't have found half the things that I've... You yeah, know, I'm interested in you know without Netflix, and it's just like little blips, you mm. know. It's, yeah. There's also, I think, from my perspective, a little bit of a tourism aspect that if you watch this show, you are getting to see something that's not like what you see yeah. in your own daily life. Um, could you pick out anything in particular where it's like, ooh, that that's different? That that's not the way my school was, or something. Definitely, the whole aspect of kind of like the boarding school feel. It's not boarding schools, but that's the feel you get with the, the Asian uniforms. culture. It's the uniforms and much more of a strict environment. Also, the food and everything is really interesting to me. And just the way they're... I feel like they have more of... At times, I guess it depends on which country the show is set in. At times, it feels like they have much more simplistic style. But then there's another... There'll be another one. And it's like... Hello Kitty exploded, you know? So yeah. to me, it's just, it's, it's really interesting seeing that. And I don't know that I'll ever make it out to Japan or China to visit. So to, it's, it, it is a tourism tour. thing. Yeah. yeah. And I can kind of add on to, to your statement with my own experience was to say also the sort of senior junior relationship is very mm -hmm. different from Western culture. The respect you have for even yes. a, one class above you. Um, and then also just the idea of, Contrary to the Western model, it seems like built into the plot of the show is that you uh, really have to try to work into, to get into a good high school, even, and which is a very different kind of perspective than it is here. You just get in in high school, um, and so like yeah, that that kind of like what is it like in the world that you're watching is like a fun part of it, even if it's not the plot, I think, for, for some of these shows. And mm -hmm. Westworld's similar, right? That you have, um, you get to like see a day in the life of the saloon. You get to see a day in the life of these different locations. Um, is there a part of Westworld for you that was like, I really love hanging out with this character. Like my favorite character is Maeve or my favorite character is this person. I think it switches. Um, I think they, flip the script on you pretty well where you really like somebody to start with and then all of a sudden crap 
they're terrible. And mm-hmm. then you and then you they build up another character and and I do enjoy that. I like getting the multidimensional characters because a lot of times when they when you introduce a character to a show, they show this kind of flat perspective like, "Oh, this person's a villain and this person is the good guy." And in as in real life, Westworld is really great about showing that everyone has a bit of each. And Maeve is one of my favorite characters. But, you know, she's flawed as well. Um, but, you know, I kind of appreciate that about her. Um, most of them are highly crazy, though. Sure. So, <laughs> but I appreciate them, just would never want to meet them. Yeah. In life. <laughs> so we mentioned, like, what you guys are watching right now. But I think there's also this concept when you say, when someone asks you what's your favorite show, there's a little bit of curation. Um, and I'll give you, like, a little anecdote. Uh, I think one of the first things I ever wrote that wasn't, like, for school was I had this joke where when people were asking what your favorite show was, I would say The Simpsons, which was my favorite show. But then as a kid, there's a little bit of, like, oh, it's a cartoon show. That's, like, it's edgier to say you know, a cop drama or something, right? Mm-hmm. And so I would argue, like, oh, no, it's like the fact that it's animated means that they don't have to have a budget to make um, parodies. Like, if they're going to do a movie parody, they don't have a build to set, they can just draw it. And that it has the same writers from Saturday Night Live, and that it's it's a, it's an adult, smart show. And then they'd be like, okay, what's your second favorite show? And I would say Bugs Bunny. <laughs> like, to try to, like, undercut, like, like oh, you're just putting me on kind of thing. So, like, but I remember distinctly that thing of, like, it's a little bit of a stat check to see, like, how cool are you? What's your favorite show? What are you into? I used to care about that. Now I don't. Mm -hmm. Which is weird because that is a part of growing up where it's, like, that weird pubertyism of (laughs) your interests. Um, For me, um, asking what my favorite show is brings out a lot of anxiety because there is those layers. There's what you're currently watching is not necessarily your favorite of all time or is your favorite of all time. You're going to miss, like, a couple, you know, different shows that also affected you, you know, where you're just like, oh, I hate, like, I'm two days later, I'm thinking about what I forgot. And um, I'm sure I'm going to do that again today. But, um, you know, also, why would you watch the same thing all the time? Like, I love anime as a blanket, you know, like, there's going to be a lot of stuff that I'm not going to name every single one. But, like, I love, like, or on high school. Because I love all those tropes. Like, everything they touch on, like, is hilarious to me because it it really fills all the anime stuff that I kind of love. And, um, but I also started watching, like, old anime or, like, you know, newer ones being an adult now. I'm just like, do I fall into that? Because a lot of it seems YA, um, young adult. And so I'm just like, oh, I don't know. (laughs) Am I grasping at my youth? I don't know. Um, But then, you know, do after that, you know, what do I watch? And it's X-Files or Criminal Minds or CSI or something like that. So just like characters that we watch, we're also so multidimensional in our shows. And then, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like there's so much to cover in this category that maybe we dug ourselves in a hole. Yeah. No, I, it's, <laughs> it's fun shows. to talk about the concept of favorite mm-hmm. shows. So um, I think to, to push you on that, um, you, you meet someone at a bus stop and you're friendly and you seem to get along and they kind of ask, what's your favorite show all time? What, what would be an answer you might have, Ashley? Uh, I have two-ish. Yeah. Well, sure. it's Buffy. Mm-hmm. Buffy, Buffy, Buffy. I think I was too young to, to watch it, it. Okay. when I was younger. I mean, I remember sixth grade, I had a friend and every week after the Buffy episode, the next day no one bothered us at lunchtime because we would just sit there and dissect the episode from the night before mm-hmm. uh we again we were probably too young to be watching it but it was awesome and joss whedon his writing mm-hmm. and in the similar vein um i really love anything rob thomas does so veronica mars mm-hmm. ended too soon and he now he does i zombie mm-hmm. and it, it's of course ending after this next season all my shows go i love the writing Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff that I didn't catch on to until later in life. Yeah, and when Veronica you're older. Mars was something that I did. Um, yeah, I watched it as a teenager, and I didn't love it as much. And then I went back and watched it as an adult. And I'm, I definitely agree. Mm-hmm. The, the humor and the writing in Veronica Mars, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, something that I liked in the past but also revisited and love even more now is X-Files. Like, to me... Um, if not my top, it's one of my top three, I would say, safely, is X. 
Okay. That's fine. You guys picked great uh, iconic uh, shows because they were like hugely impactful. Mm -hmm. um, X Files created that what they now call a genre of like the monster of the week mm -hmm. concept. Did you fulfill that with like watching Fringe later? Yes, but Fringe. For me, sometimes shows should end earlier <laughs> than sure. they than they choose you know choose to because they get that network money, and Fringe was one of those. Um, X Files, like I greatly appreciated their like having those breaks between the crazy arc, um, you know. So the monster of the week was very important to me because of my empathy issues. <laughs> like just having the monster of the week was a break from the craziness of the main arc of, you know, like Mulder's adopted, like abducted sister or, um, or Scully being impregnated and stuff like that. So it's, it gets heavy. Oh, I, <laughs> this is new to me. I never watched and like, X-Files. You know, so. so like their emotions really translate to me. And whenever they're just getting a monster of the week, there's some calmness in, and that's why I like procedural crime dramas. So everything gets tidy, wrapped up in a bow, mm -hmm. at the end of 30 minutes an hour. And that's my safe space. Yeah. That's why things end up in my, my top favorites. Did you ever, have you watched Supernatural at all? Did yes. we have this I, conversation? I watched like the first like four or five seasons. Okay. Yeah. I still am hanging on to that show. I'm a habitual, <laughs> I don't finish, I don't finish shows because I, I like hold on to that like last episode or two and I'm like, I don't want it to end. <laughs> In, in both the case of X Files and now coming up for Buffy, um, the the idea of the remake mm -hmm. reimagining thing has happened. Mm -hmm. In X Files, they got the original principles, um, and for Buffy, they're gonna have Joss Whedon involved, but like a new cast. So, like in a general sense, positive, negative feelings towards that kind of reimagining. Yeah, I'm really excited for a diverse, a different cast. Buffy to me. The, the later seasons, I didn't love as much as the, the first, like, after the college years, Buffy, I kind of didn't watch it as religiously, but I still, it's still, like, there in my heart. So I'm excited to see what they do with the new cast and Joss Whedon, his writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, like, sorry, I, I might feel bad if I didn't, um, like, press you on this. The current thing with Joss Whedon and, like, extracurricular outside of writing like issues with his like home life does that affect your experience at all i don't get into pop culture okay. anymore so i have no idea is so it it's bad like ignorance is bliss like it's a kind of like people feel that maybe he um he cheated on his wife and <gasps> oh that really he, oh, yeah. shoot i didn't know that yeah. Oh. yeah and that kind of stuff does it does affect me yeah. And how, how and much you, you it affects me guys. too. Wow. Yeah. But, now well, I feel bad. But ironically, it didn't <laughs> affect you until you heard about well, it. I so, heard about yeah. it. No, I'm like, yeah. oh no. So, I mean, like, I think both are normal experiences that you could just, like, I'm here for the show and I don't, like, extracurricular things aren't really part of it for me. Let, let the corporations, like, figure that out for me. Okay. Uh, but the other thing, too, is that um, uh, I think something you hit on. Roxanne about like the detective shows mm -hmm. is that there's this thing where in these shows they have a um, like you said that they wrap up nicely right mm -hmm. and so like there's a through line for both Buffy and X-Files is that and they also have some similarities to like anime where they're an ongoing story they have um, episodic nature too so like they'll have like a full like whatever the adventure is this week but then also ongoing things that they kind of touch base with right um, and those are kind of used to be rare in American like TV shows. They used to be more like whatever happened, they're going to reset the next episode and they could air them out of any order. Um, so that was kind of a change where like it matters that it ha goes in order because like there's consequences from one to the next. So is that important to you guys? Like the ongoing kind of like, l like living with these characters and growing up with them and seeing them grow? It matters to me. Growth, I think growth is important in yeah. my books and my shows. <laughs> it's, it's important. Yeah. I think I develop a relationship yeah. with all of them, and I want to see them learn from past mistakes. I want to, you know, see them nurture each other's personalities. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. weird, but, I mean, these characters that, you know, you pick as your favorites, like, they're very well-developed, and you spend so... Like, if you're spending 10 seasons with them, I mean, and they're, like, 30 episodes a pop, you know? Like, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I've dedicated a lot of hours to these fictional characters and more than I have with some, you know, people in real life. So, 
it matters to me <laughs> that they grow and they experience stuff and they learn and there needs to be more than a self-contained baby tiny episode yeah and another thing that's kind of interesting with that is that there's a comfort level with certain shows and that even goes into the plot of them so um, I'm referring to it as the Cheers effect. So the TV, the sitcoms Cheers, it's set in a bar, pretty much one location. Maybe they stepped out of the bar like once the whole show. And so the idea is that like you have a location and it has to be a fun place to hang out as an audience member. You almost feel like you're at the bar per se. And so even if you're not specifically into Cheers, similar thing at like Seinfeld, that it's like you're hanging out in Jerry's apartment, you're hanging out in that diner with them. Um, so do you have like locations and shows that like you kind of feel like you wish you could hang out there like I did love Cheers and I did love Frasier I do love Frasier but mm-hmm. it's not past tense um I guess like like Pawnee with Parks yeah. and Rec like there were certain places that made you know that entire show is a feel good mm-hmm. um and I feel very connected to Pawnee because you can have so many parallels to, well, our jobs. Yeah. I work for parks, <laughs> right. you know? So there's a lot of homeness to it because I can relate so well with my job, even though I don't physically go out and search for park venues, but I also, like, I just have to, in the nature of my job, go to different facilities that do similar things. So there's something so special to me specifically about parks, mm-hmm. uh, Parks and Rec. Now, I want to ask you, actually, if you've had this experience, that um, I think in K-dramas, the one thing they do different than they do over here is that they'll really lavishly show characters eating, like that that's oh like gosh, a, yes. like <laughs> social eating, that like they, they stay away from in Hollywood because the idea is that they'd have to reset or make the actors eat, and then they would get full, and then they'd have to eat again for another take. But that's like something that's like they have to show because mm-hmm. it's like one of the fun climaxes is eating in the shows. Is that, have you had that watching them and are there other things like that that you enjoy watching in, in K-dramas or Asian dramas? I mean, the food. I mean, yeah. I think it's funny how usually there's the tropes in the, in the K-dramas with the, you know, the girl who is usually clumsy and she eats too much and she's following the boy around. I think it's, it's cute. It's silly. I mean, it's, that's like Sailor Moon. Yeah, it's exactly. It's Sailor Moon. Yeah, yeah. Which, like, which we grew up with. I mean, speaking of food, I do want to say my Bob's Burgers. I do love Bob's Burgers. Yeah. That, I would want to go hang out there. So not just food, but you said burgers. <laughs> in, in those shows, like, meat is, like, a, the thing that it's, like, if you love someone, you take them for a barbecue. Because I guess it's, like, meat <laughs> is expensive, you know? Which is kind of another cultural weird thing. But, um, yeah, sure. so you, you mentioned about burgers, um... Is there are there shows that um, you wish you liked or that like you wish you could have got into, uh, but the timing was wrong or for whatever reason? Maybe X Files for me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think I missed the window on that. X Files. Like, <laughs> I feel like I missed a lot of windows. I, like we were talking earlier, how I was more so an outside kid, so. There were a lot of things that I didn't get into until like near the end of high school or something like that. Um, 30 now, so like there's some things where I guess people would naturally have watched it at a certain age where I'm just like, eh, I mean, I'll try it later. Um, but I don't know if I feel like I've missed the boat truly on, on something. Um, well, particularly to your lives, there's this thing as you become an adult, I think, where um, you're not just for yourself, but there's also the thing of like, if your spouse starts a show, then it's like, oh, well, I missed out on that. Like, they're already halfway into it. Or there could oh. be the thing of like, oh, yeah. wait for me, let's start this show together. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> Actually, so, um, I don't have that because really, um, I didn't watch like Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z when I was younger, but when I started dating Andrew, Like, he had made so many parallels with Sailor Moon, which is, like, the girl version, Mm -hmm. Um, but not, you know, so different. At, I mean, at, like, younger 20s, I started Dragon Ball, but I didn't feel like I was too old for it. I mean, it was just late coming to that, you know, but, like, I grew up, like, in middle, like, when I had American TV, um, just watching Toonami, which I'm so glad that I got that window in time mm-hmm. because Toonami was pretty short-lived. And, like, I cried when Tom died. Like, <laughs> and I'm just like, he hosts for five minutes, yeah. like, collectively for a day. 
And then I was just this like little CGI robot that just promotes the shows. That's all he does. <laughs> but it, it was very important to me that Toonami was a thing and Midnight Run. And like those things really shaped my fandom, my, you know, like a lot of a lot of relationships with friends because it was, you know, not not the cheers effect, but a lot of things that we all watched it and stuff and connected mm-hmm. that way. Connected. Right? Well, you just touched on something huge, was the fact that um, we used to be tied to actual network broadcast times, mm-hmm. and you were saying that Sailor Moon was like the female Dragon Ball, and now now we have the opportunity to say that there's like a plethora of choices, but at that time, the ones that were being physically broadcast and on our channels were Dragon Ball Z and yes. Sailor Moon. Not a lot of. Um, animes were licensed in America and so um, you were restricted to what was an option yeah. and not just the option but like if you were in school you didn't get to see those if you were, if they were right after school you had a good window before your parents took over the TV or made mm-hmm. you stop watching so um, we used to be tied to that time aspect but now we're in this era of streaming where it's like Lucky. you can binge watch <laughs> yeah. you can watch it whenever you want yeah cause like I felt like Getting into anime when we did, which I don't know if it's for you guys, but like early 2000s anime was like roulette. I mean, like I'd go to, and I ended up working at Movie Gallery, which like was ridiculous. Working at a movie store, which is now dead, um, which is dating me as well. Like working in a physical, like a not blockbuster movie gallery. Um, like I'd go to Movie Gallery because Blockbuster didn't even carry anime. And sort of like by the cover maybe kind of choose if it's interesting and then like go home and like maybe it was hentai and you had no idea though (laughs) (laughs) you're just like well (laughs) and now you don't like you have to really specifically look for that or something on the internet now but i mean and there was so much that wasn't translated so we only had subtitles and Uh stuff where anime kids now or manga kids are totally different spoiled yeah completely because we had maybe five choices I feel like and um, like I was lucky enough to have a cousin or I guess he's still my cousin Uh, (laughs) (laughs) but he collected like he was the one who like ordered all this stuff um, and had it shipped overseas so I got to actually watch like Ranma and a Half and Udna and all this stuff like a lot sooner than like I guess a lot of people could and that was just like a mixed blessing there um, because I wouldn't have to like hang out with my weird cousin, but like <laughs> also I got to experience some cool stuff that I wouldn't have otherwise. It was a treat. Well, to tie back to our previous conversation, AWA anime conventions were born out of a specific need where when there wasn't availability for shows, you would have physical VHS tapes mm-hmm. that people would bring and trade. Um, yeah. And it was so that was that used to be a driving factor. Um, and I feel like I can ask you on air here that like maybe we should have another episode where we talk about anime because we're getting so into <laughs> yeah I mean it's a whole thing yeah and, yeah it's... and like it being a, I feel like a lot of people I at least for me um, like I really was started drawing because of anime and mm-hmm. stuff like that not I always had an interest but my sure. style transformed because yeah. of it so I mean it could be its own episode for sure and another thing you you touched on was saying seeing uh, covers and then watching it. Um, which taps into another thing, which is OAVs versus TV shows. So that in Japan specifically, they have an animation culture where they would get like an extra budget to have like shows that were designed to be on VHS as opposed to designed to be on TV. So that would, that would be different and they'd often be higher quality Mm -hmm. and you wouldn't have commercials. So like, that's kind of interesting too, that, that the idea of like, now we have it's evolved that TV shows don't have to have commercials. That used to be part of it. Um, I remember growing up, many shows they were written in a way where they'd be like cliffhangers or mini cliffhangers, mm-hmm. where you know a character would walk in and be like, "I can't believe you," and then like it would cut, hoping to get you back after the break, right? Um, and now they don't have to be torn or um, married to that, and especially for prestige shows like Westworld and for mm-hmm. um, animes too that they are they just don't have that same sort of restriction um do you think that has that affected for you like the not having commercials like so for instance a very practical thing is we used to like tape favorite shows on a vcr and then you would actually get to see a little snapshot of time when like whatever commercials were on with the show with it i love that 
um, like Andrew and I are, my husband, we're very into that kind of nostalgia. So being able to see that, like we'll go on um, YouTube to just look at 80s and 90s commercials. Like that is one thing. We can get into a whole YouTube episode as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, like things like that, like the, um, like the made for TV series, like watching Dragon Ball and Sailor Moon and all these other series, they had that built in uh, bookends of, uh, you know, like you can tell, like even watching a series on Hulu where they show like a little animation of like Goku, like spinning the ball, like the four star ball. And that's like the beginning of they're about to show commercials. And then right. he comes back and he like drops the ball or whatever. And then they go back to the episode. So like you still know now, like where those breaks were mm-hmm. and where they had like built in that cliffhanger for mm-hmm. a sec, but you just don't get the middle part. So I still know where they decided to chop it all up. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So we already started talking about it, but uh, people say that we're kind of in a golden age of TV. And so I think that start off by saying that just in terms of prestige, like they're getting better actors, movie actors per se. Um, like So shows like Breaking Bad and Mad Men were kind of like these things that changed the way we thought of what a TV show could be. They could be things that um, are better than the movies that are coming out for some people. And so tied into that is that now that there may be streaming things, there might be, um, there might be uh, shows that they purposely like hire an uh, actor that you wouldn't expect. Like there are all these kind of things going on now that are different. So like, do you believe that? Actually, I'll give it to you first. Like, do you think we're living in the golden age? Do you think the golden age was your nostalgic youth era? Like, what is the golden age of TV? Oh, I definitely think it would be now. I mean, we, my husband and I have conversation all the time about the 90s shows that we watch growing, especially the Nickelodeon shows. Now yes. it's more Disney is, I feel like, more popular, but when, I, when we were kids, mm-hmm. it was definitely all the Nickelodeon shows. But, I mean, as far as acting and quality and everything, I think definitely it's where we are right now, and especially with um, kind of getting a little off topic. Like this, we were talking earlier about the, the new movie, um, To All the Boys I Love, mm-hmm. or To All the Boys I Love Before. I Love Before, but it's a young adult book by Jenny Han that they made into a Netflix movie. I watched that movie and I'm like, I do not feel like this is a Netflix quality movie. It felt like a movie that I could have, I would have paid to go see this in theaters. And that the fact that we have something such great quality on a streaming service to me is mm-hmm. is great. I mean, and you know, TV yeah. movies are like, not. Like, yeah, these networks and these businesses are like, I feel like movie um, networks, or not networks, but you know, the it, studios, the movie studios um, are struggling a bit competing with these um, with these shows that Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, they're all providing. Um, I think it's great. The competition, um, you know, is healthy, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and seeing all these people go into series, um, it gives you kind of a better idea of like their acting skills too because I mean, what you see somebody act, like act in a movie, and you'd have to wait like a whole like year or two to see the next movie they're in. Whereas you know, a lot of people are starting to do both because you know, for a series, you only have to be there for a certain amount of time and you can leave or whatever. Um, I just kind of appreciate that everybody has to raise the bar. Mm-hmm. Um, so that means that's good for us. Mm-hmm. Now, to play devil's advocate, there, um, there's like a, a writer named Jack Allison who was questioning some of the bad side effects potentially with this era of quote unquote golden age. Was saying that, like for instance, like in the show The Handmaid's Tale, he noticed that because they were trying to pad the length of the story, there'd be episodes where they would show a character in quiet contemplation, and it would just basically be like a camera focused on a person's face with like music playing. Mm-hmm. And so, like he was pointing out that like now that there's this obligation to seasons that they might need to like stretch things out whereas they it used to be a, a motivation to tell a story and complete a story but now there's like oh boy we need to have like a six episode order so we need to like pad this out with like quote unquote filler which is like kind of an anime concept too yeah um the filler and nobody does filler as crappy as dragon ball z um, <laughs> right. but because you're holding an energy ball for, for three an episodes. entire yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I am no stranger to that lovely filler. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, the thing is, is wouldn't it challenge you to have better filler? You know? That's the hope. Yeah. Like, (laughs) that, to me, is do better. 
mm-hmm. men because you can absolutely like I remember this one terrible episode of Breaking Bad mm-hmm. where it was a bottle episode where he's stuck in a um, I think they were like uh, making their meth in that laundry um, mm-hmm. place and he was in there with a the fly it was mm-hmm. the episode with the fly right. and he was driving him crazy and I'm like that was because you were ordered to have several episodes, uh-huh. um, and you had no idea what to do. Oh, with so it. you thought of that as a bad episode? I I thought it didn't do anything. It had its purpose, but only to make Brian Cranston show how good of an actor he is. Okay, um, because it was him. It was this basically yeah like a Brian Cranston solo. Yeah, um, but it did nothing for the series mm. to me. Um, That's an interesting kind of, possibility because like. The director of the episode, Ryan Johnson, ended up getting Last Jedi partially because of that episode. Um, so, like, for some people, a low is another person's high, I guess. Yeah, I And mean, I love what he did with The Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it's a thing where it's, like, it, it has a different purpose. Um, like, you can see, like, yes, it does great things for... Um, Characterization. For characters and stuff like that. And you can build your own world within a 30-minute 30, 30 gap, or time frame. But does it serve the bigger picture? Hmm. You know, it's questionable. Yeah. But and it was memorable, so sure. it is effective. Yeah, and it, another unique thing, speaks, <laughs> speaking specifically about Breaking Bad, was how it has the spin-off Better Call Saul, mm-hmm. which I actually enjoy more because um, Breaking Bad is, like, so sad. The guy's sick, he's doing bad things, whereas, like, Saul is kind of, like, more of a scamp. Like, yes. he's, like... A, like a nicer guy to spend time with, so that's kind of an interesting kind of like aspect too of these prestige shows. This idea mm-hmm. of spinoffs and yeah, which a lot of people don't know, Frasier is a Cheers spinoff. Sure. And Frasier is, I mean, a ridiculous character, which I love him and his family and everything. But sometimes a spinoff can be just as good as the original, which a lot of people, you know, growing up, you you always feel like the second movie is not as good as the first one or something mm-hmm. like that. Especially Disney. Yeah. Disney's the worst. <laughs> but that's how I feel. Like, I mean, you have to really work hard to make that second as good, if not better. Where a lot of people drop the ball. That, that sophomore, um, what is it? Like sophomore, a sophomoric something something? I don't know. Sophomore slump. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, as we're kind of like wrapping up on the subject, I'm wondering, is it possible for you to come up with like, what would your platonic ideal of a, of a show be? Like if, if, if someone had described a show to you, would be like, oh, that's such a your type of show. Um, I think we've all had that kind of thing where like a new show comes out and your friend's like, oh, you got to check this out. This is exactly your wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you think you have that kind of like recipe? So like just in talking to you today, I kind of feel like Ashley, if I, if I knew there was a, a new show coming out that was like set in the future, written by Joss Whedon, um, like, you know, it, it could be like these, like, maybe it's set in Korea. I don't know. Like, then you can, like <laughs> put these like recipe together. You know what I mean? Like, do you have like a sense of that? Or it's just like, I go wherever like the, the good content is. Um, it just depends for me. I like, so Joss Whedon, I, I really like his writing, you know, yeah. um, but I also love the supernatural aspect. So that also ties back to like why I love Veronica Mars and iZombie because I think Rob Thomas has a very similar writing style to Joss Whedon, and I love it, the humor in his shows and the character relationships. Um, and kind of the same, I love Supernatural mm-hmm. and the char- the same thing. They've got they're dealing with something serious. The world's about to end. They've got all this crap, but they're still making jokes and it's still yeah. all about the relationship. So I don't know. Give me something with some uh, maybe set it in Korea with like some <laughs> werewolves or vampires yeah. or something and some one liners. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I could imagine like did you like Sleepy Hollow? Uh, the show I watched like the first season. I okay. loved it. I kind of, yeah. After the first season I didn't go back to I liked it. I did a lot. But <laughs> Do you have one, Roxanne? Like, do you have your, like, that would be totally me if um, this show was like this? I think there are a lot of things that, like, people kind of pick at, like, my personality and would, would kind of notice and be like, oh, that's a Roxanne thing. Um, things with that are probably inherently adorable but have a creepiness factor <laughs> or um, something that is, like, just slightly off in any kind of way. Be like, oh yeah, that kind of reminds me. Like it's Roxanne-ish or something. Um, 
there's usually like there, there's some kind of weird optimism to things mm-hmm. with a slight like oh but I mean it like it's also during the time of Halloween or something like that mm-hmm. which I'm not you know you wouldn't look at me and be like that girl she loves Halloween loves. no no <laughs> yeah but I mean there's some things that um I think that cuteness factor mm-hmm. people look at it and be like yeah Roxanne will probably like that uh, <laughs> like yeah. just for an example um like over the garden wall, that was kind of like a mini series. They they did not stretch out too far, um, where it like the animation's great and everything, but it has that like vintage Halloween feel to it, um, where a lot of people that was like a huge recommendation for me, um, as an example, like. Okay. Well, this is a special episode in the sense this is our first episode with uh, two guests at once. So taking advantage of this unique format, I was wondering if I could put you guys on the spot as like a last thing. If um, in lieu of uh, the the usual telling people where to find you, which we did in the last episode, um, could you give each other a prescription of a show that is your favorite, either that you think they would like or that you want them to watch even if they wouldn't watch it normally so that they can like it like you do? I'm not going first. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so I need to tell her a show that yeah. I watch. Yeah, you're that... giving her a prescription. Watch this show. I feel like we do this on a day to day. We basis. do this. So yeah, do it. Just do it um, live. I mean, I don't want to. Oh, like I already want to watch Meteor. Garden. I was about to say Meteor Garden like, was the one I'm going to say that I because yeah. it's my current obsession. Um, I, I had to to Google the main actor and make sure he was over 18, so it was okay for me to have a crush on him. I was like, okay, good, he's 19. I can I can have a crush on him. Um, let's see, Meteor Garden. Um... It kind of sounds like Exiles would be a good fit too, since you always meant to. Yeah. Yeah. What would I tell you to watch? I don't know, but it's also. Do you I'm trying to think of one I... that Beth and I both watch? Cause... Yeah, because I would tell you to watch anything Miyazaki. And, you know, like, hey, that's my vibe. Look at this. You know, <laughs> I think you would like it, too. <laughs> um, for. That's kind of a tough one. And you'll probably edit the crap out of these, like, gaps in time. Yeah. Um, but if you haven't watched Over the Garden Wall. I have not. Um, I think that that one is a great way of, like, building in that traditional Nickelodeon feel mixed with um like something that's a little bit more current like well i guess sort of current where you kind of f- feel it adventure time ish mm-hmm. um and like all the like little i want to say witchy ish things oh i just thought of one yeah so you just gave <laughs> but, let me think of one to tell that i'm but, gonna prescribe uh, for you over the garden wall would be one of those things where um it has that slight creep but it's not too much into that field where it would um, alienate anyone and make them feel like that's a little much you know it, it's it's a very safe space I feel where can I watch it Hulu I think Hulu okay yeah. good thing I got and I that don't have, free month right now. yeah I don't have regular <laughs> cable so everything is going to be a streaming service for me yeah yeah okay you should watch Yona of the Dawn because I don't think you've watched that one I haven't where do it's I watch on, it? Well, I watch it on Crunchyroll, but I think you can find it on others. <laughs> you can watch it for free on Crunchyroll. You just have to deal with the commercials. But it's kind of an adventure-ish one about this spoiled princess. and But she <laughs> she has to leave her castle, you know, and she has to go on this adventure and find these... I'm not... I don't want to give away, but... And there's a boy that she travels with her that she fights with all the time, but, you know, you see the tension there. That is so formulaic. So it's, that is, it's, like... That's the... Um, it's those are the books adorable. that I also read, too. <laughs> it, it's a manga as well, and the, I'm, I will say that I'm really sad the that the anime only lasted one season. They haven't done anything else with it, so I've got to get on the manga so I can find that's out That's how I happens. feel about Oran. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Roxanne and Ashley. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. ba da da Find more information at doubleprimary.com.